Hi, and welcome to Harvest Bible Chapel, Kuala Lumpur Online. We hope that the following message will be a blessing to you as you seek to walk with the Lord in spirit and in truth. For more information about our church, please visit www.harvestkl.org or click the link in the description below. Well, good morning, Harvest. You guys are still waking up a little bit. That's okay. My name is Peter, and I'm one of the pastors here, and it's so good to be with you. And I figured that since Harvest has been in this Isaiah series for like the last seven years or something like that, that we just take the week off and go somewhere else. Uh, as you hear that, you might have mixed emotions. You're like, no, we're almost there. Um, some of you guys are like, whew, let's take a break. But I'm just kidding. We're going to continue on in Isaiah chapter 57. Hopefully by now you know where Isaiah is in your Bibles. Your pages are worn. You can just tell by looking out the outside exactly where it is. So go ahead and turn to Isaiah 57. Last weekend, Pastor Eric showed us how we should live in community together with Christ as our King and how the gospel is for everyone. It was great and exciting news. But as we begin the chapter this week, it starts off with some really bad news. And we're going to look at three things. Okay, who we are, who God is, and who God desires to make us, who he wants us to be. So who we are, who God is, and who God desires to make us. Take a look with me. Isaiah 57 verse 1 says, The righteous man perishes, and no one lays it to heart. Devout men are taken away, while no one understands. So the first thing we see right away is that things in Israel are bad. Good and righteous people are suffering and dying, and no one gives it any thought. It makes no sense. No one understands why bad things are happening to good people. We can relate to this, right? If there's one thing that everyone in the world can agree with, it's not that you know fried chicken is better than regular chicken or one sports team is better than another sports team or anything like that, but it's that suffering and brokenness are a reality for everyone. Right? Loved ones die unexpectedly. You're diagnosed with an illness, or you're in an accident, that's not your fault. And we think good people, especially those who have faith in God, should be exempt from suffering. Right? We shouldn't have to go through the hard things in life. We should only experience the blessings and favor of God. I mean, I would, I would vote for that. Have you ever felt this way? You're serving and you're living for God and you're being generous with your, your money, and all of a sudden... Someone steals your phone or your car gets flooded. You know, we, when we first moved here and when we were looking for a car, people, that's something that people told us, oh, you have to be really careful because you don't want to buy a flooded car. And in my mind, I was like, what does that even mean? Like, that doesn't really happen where I'm from until this past week when our street was flooded. I was like, oh, my goodness, that's what they're talking about. It's crazy. Right? Or maybe you randomly get injured. Your body is failing you. In our minds, if you're good then good things should happen to you. And bad things should only happen to people who are bad. How could a good God allow us, even those who believe in him, to suffer? But it gets worse. The suffering we experience is ultimately our fault. Now, sometimes we face the direct natural consequences for our sins. But I'm not talking about that here today. I'm not saying that the reason that you got sick or lost your job or lost a loved one is a direct consequence of your sin. Okay, I'm talking about the general brokenness of this world. When things don't make sense and something happens when you feel like you're innocent. Let's keep reading in Isaiah, starting in verse three. It says, but you draw near sons of the sorceress, offspring of the adulterer and the loose woman. Whom are you mocking? Against whom do you open your mouth wide and stick out your tongue? Are you not children of transgression, of offspring, the offspring of deceit? You who burn with lust among the oaks under every green tree, who slaughter your children in the valleries under the cleft of the rocks. Among the smooth stones of the valley is your portion. They, they are your lot. To them you have poured out a drink offering. You have brought a grain offering. Shall I relent for these things? On a high and lofty mountain, you have set your bed, and there you went up to offer sacrifice. Behind the door and the doorpost, you have set up your memorial. 
For deserting me, you have uncovered your bed. You have gone up to it. You have made it wide, and you have made a covenant for yourself with them. You have loved their bed. You have looked on nakedness. You journeyed to the king with oil and multiplied your perfumes. You sent your envoys far off and sent down even to Sheol. You were wearied with the length of your ways, but you did not say it is hopeless. You found new life for your strength, and so you were not faint. Whom did you dread and fear so that you lied and did not remember me, did not lay it to heart? Have I not held my peace even for a long time, and you still do not fear me? I will declare your righteousness and your deeds, but they will not profit you. When you cry out, let your collection of idols deliver you. The wind will carry them all off, for a breath will take them away. Now, Isaiah is differentiating here the righteous from the wicked. And maybe you're thinking, as I read those verses, I've never done any of those things. That doesn't sound like me. But we should not, we would not be reading the text honestly. We would not be reading the Bible honestly if we only put ourselves in the places where it talks about the righteous. All right, so let's go all the way back to Genesis. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and he created man in his own image. And he said, after he saw everything that he created, that it was all good. Everything was good and perfect until just two chapters later in Genesis 3, where we as mankind, we decided that we didn't want God to be our God. We wanted to be God. We wanted to do things our own way and not his. We would no longer allow God to determine what is good because we think we know better. And we're going to decide for ourselves what's good. And so we reject God and we turn away from him. And when Adam, when God finds Adam and Eve, he confronts them and he asks them when they're hiding from them, from him, he says, who told you you were naked? And that might sound a little bit funny for our context here today, but it just means that in the beginning, before there was sin, Adam and Eve were naked. There was nothing to be ashamed of. There was nothing that it was hidden. And they had a perfect relationship with God. And when God asked them that, who told you you were naked? Basically, he was asking them, who else have you been listening to? Who else have you been listening to other than me, other than my good voice? And this is the problem. Every single problem in the world's history can be traced back to this. We've stopped listening to and obeying and trusting God, and we decided we're going to do things our own way. And the consequences of this decision, they were disastrous, right? Once everything was good and perfect, there was perfect peace, but now death was introduced into the world. The earth was cursed. The relationship between fellow man would be broken. And most important of all, we lost God's presence. Okay, we weren't just forced away from God, but we chose to walk away from him. And from that moment on, everything would be broken. We would all become children of transgression. That would be our very nature. We would be idolaters worshipers of things who are not truly God. In our idolatry, this rejection of God and his good created order is the reason for all the suffering and brokenness in this world. Maybe you're still thinking, that's not me. I'm not Adam. I'm not Eve. I'm not Israel. But I would say that we may not practice idolatry and sin in the exact same ways as they did or in the Bible, but we've traded one form of sin or idolatry for another. And I would say in many seemingly more acceptable and subtle ways, but equally as evil. Okay, take a look with me at some of the sins in Isaiah 57. They sacrificed their babies. And you might again think, well, I don't do that. We don't do that here today. But there are people, and it is in many parts of the world, societally acceptable to take the lives of babies in the womb. Or let's talk about the opposite. Maybe we will teach our kids to live for the things of this world, to worship the God of success or education or career instead of following Jesus. And that is leading them down a path toward their destruction. Next, we see that Israel was sexually immoral. Maybe you've never had an affair or slept around, but you have looked at and thought about people who are not your husband and wife in an impure way. 
And Jesus says, doing that is the same thing as committing adultery. Next, Israel, they worship rocks and stones. And I, I mean, we probably look at that and say, that's just not smart. That's, that's kind of dumb, All right? But we, we do the same thing with our stuff. We think, if I can just get this thing, or if I can just have this, if I can just obtain this, then I'll be happy, All right? Before we had kids, my wife and I were fairly newly married, and we had, this is back when we can like have, have and enjoy our own things, right? You know, before they, it all became our kids' stuff. Back then, this was many years ago, I had this amazing guitar. I mean, it was this beautiful piece of work. It looked amazing. One time I was in my office and I was looking at the computer and, I was, and my wife, the door was behind me and my wife walked in and she heard me say, you are so beautiful. And she thought I was looking at something inappropriate. And she said, what are you looking at? I said, come here, look at this guitar. I ended up getting it. It looked amazing. It was so beautiful. I would just look at, just hold it like this, like a baby, and just stare at it. It sounded heavenly as if God himself made it. And even smelled good. And so I'd just pick it up, and I'd stick my nose in there, and I'd smell it. And Grace would say, you love and take care of that guitar more than me. And depending on the day, it was, it was true. <laughs> and we think in our minds, like, you know, it's just stuff. But if something were to ever happen to that guitar or something were to ever happen to your stuff, we would be devastated. Now, here's some other signs that we, we might worship. We might not worship things, but here's some signs that we worship ourselves, right? First, you obsess about what other people think of you. You care your, your image and what people see you and how people see you, what they think of you just over, overwhelms you. Next, you're prideful. You put other people down so that you can feel good about yourself. You look down on others who have less money. Their car is not as nice. Their neighborhood is not as nice. Their clothes and their shoes, they're not name brand. They have less status. They work a lower class job. They're not as attractive, not as athletic, of a different race or ethnicity or family name, of a different religious background, not as educated, not as morally or theologically astute. They haven't had the same kind of life experiences. They haven't been a Christian as long. They're not married. They don't have kids or they don't have as many kids as I do. All right, have I left anything out? We find any number of reasons to look down on others so that we can make ourselves something. Next, maybe you feel entitled. Entitlement is when you think, I deserve blank because of blank. You might think, I deserve a better life because I'm a good person. But the reality is, the only thing that we deserve apart from Christ is death. God doesn't owe you or me anything. And everything good that we have is grace. Maybe you have a complaining or comparing heart. You look at other people and see what they have and what their life is like. And you think, why can't I have that? I work just as hard as them. I'm just as smart. Versus having a heart that's content with what God has given you. You have a heart that is thankful and full of gratitude. Next, maybe you're greedy. You have an insatiable thirst for yourself. You're never satisfied with what you have, and you're not generous with your time, your talent, your treasure. Or maybe you struggle with unforgiveness. You withhold forgiveness because you think the person that has wronged you doesn't deserve it, even though Jesus, he freely forgives you. Or maybe you struggle with worry or bitterness. I love how Pastor Tim Keller said it. He said, worry is when you think God won't get it right in your life. And bitterness is when you think God God got something wrong in your life, right? Or maybe you struggle with having control. You have the perfect picture of what life should be, and you're angered and you're frustrated when it doesn't go according to your plan. And lastly, you may be self-centered. You always and only look to your own interests and how God and other people can benefit you and serve you and your agenda. Listen, scripture is very clear. Isaiah 53 we all, like sheep, have gone astray, each of us to his own way. Romans 3, 23, we have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Isaiah 57, our chapter here today, verse 8, we've deserted God. Verse 11, we did not remember him and did not fear him. We've committed spiritual adultery against God with, without shame and reveals that our hearts are truly wicked. And it may, that may sound harsh, but that's what God calls it. And you know what's sad 
is that we love, we love and we are committed to our idolatry, even though it is completely irrational and it's devastating to us, even though our idols are worthless, they're not able to save us, unable to satisfy us and deliver on their promises of joy and peace and hope and life. We still love them. We want to believe that they can. This past week, um, if you're following news in the U.S., there was a big deal because the U.S. lottery had reached over 1.7 billion U.S. dollars. That's, a, that's the equivalent of over 8 billion ringgit. That's a lot of zeros. That's like nine zeros, I think. It's a lot of money. And when I saw that, when I read the article, I thought, I think that would make me happy if I had all that money. I could make myself happy with that money. Think of all the things that I could do and buy and enjoy. I really wouldn't have to worry about anything if I had won the lottery. And then I kind of came to my senses and I thought, well, number one, I'm here in Malaysia. I can't buy a lottery ticket. Um, I've never bought a lottery ticket before. I don't even know how to do that. And then number two, I've, I've lived life long enough to know that outside of the essentials for life, like food and water and shelter, if money can buy it or if money can fix it, then it's not really that big a problem. It's not. It can't make my marriage healthy. It can't make my kids love and follow Jesus. It can't fix my sinful heart. It can't do any of those things. But we still love our idols, don't we? Verse 8 says that we've covenanted with them, like in marriage. Verse 10 says that we were so idolatrous that we wore ourselves out. We made ourselves tired serving and pursuing our idols. And we didn't say, oh, this doesn't make sense. We, we didn't say this is hopeless. Let, let me just turn back to God. That's so much better. And even when God disciplined us, we didn't change our way. We continued to backslide. Instead, Isaiah 57 says, we found new life for our strength so that we were not faint and we continued in our idolatry. Okay, this is in direct contrast to Isaiah 40, who says that, well, that says that the everlasting God, our God who doesn't grow tired or weary, we are that way with our idolatry. The prophet Jeremiah in chapter 17, he would say that our hearts are wicked and deceitful above all things. Who can understand it? You see, we're not good people that do bad things sometimes. We are wicked to our core. We're enslaved to our idols. And ironically, it shows that we're not God after all. Right, how many times have you and I said, I'm not going to do that thing anymore. That's the last time I'm going to ever do that. That's the last time I'm going to have road rage and get angry at that person and how bad of a driver they are. That's the last time that I'll have an outburst against my kids. That's the last time I'm going to look at people and pictures with lust. That's the last time I'm going to tell a lie or embellish the truth to make myself look better. It's hard. It's hard to just stop doing these things because number one, it's our nature. It's our nature to do these, these things. And number two, our hearts, they love to do them. And as Pastor Miles prayed, we as mankind as a whole and without exception, we're, we're all the problem. I take the evil, the wickedness that is in your individual heart and multiply that by 8 billion people that live on this earth. The world is broken because we are broken. And it's easy for us to treat the sin and the evil outside of us harshly and look at all the things that's that's wrong with the world but when we look at the sin in our own hearts we just we minimize it it's not it's really not that bad it's easy to look at the world and see all the darkness and all that's wrong but the reality is that the problem is in every single human heart the problem's not external the problem's not out there the problem is internal it's in here Hey, this is who we are. This is who we all are. We are idolaters who live in brokenness. It wasn't God's plan. This is not the way that he wanted it. But this is the way that we chose. So how encouraged are you feeling right now? In this first half. It gets better, I promise. Let's keep going. And look at who God is. And we only go up from here. Isaiah 57, starting in verse 14. And it shall be said, build up 
Build up, prepare the way, remove every obstruction from my people's way. For thus says the one who is high and lifted up, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place and also with him who is of a contrite and lowly spirit to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. For I will not contend forever, nor will I always be angry. For the spirit would grow faint before me in the breath of life that I made. Because of the iniquity of his unjust gain, I was angry. I struck him. I hid my face and was angry. But he went on backsliding in the way of his own heart. I have seen his ways, but I will heal him. I will lead him and restore comfort to him and his mourners, creating the fruit of the lips. Peace, peace to the far and to the near, says the Lord and I will heal him. This is who God is. First thing that we see is that he is high and holy. He is positionally high. He, his, his, the heavens are where he lives. He is sovereign. He is powerful. He has authority. He is above all things. He's high. And the Hebrew word for holy means set apart. He's free from impurity. There's zero imperfections or flaws in God and in his character. Did you know that holy is the only attribute that is ascribed to God three times? In Isaiah 6, it says, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. The whole earth is filled with this glory. The Bible doesn't say that he is life, 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 that he's peace, 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 or love, love, love even. But it says that he is is holy, holy, holy. He is completely set apart and high above. Secondly, we see verse 15, he's eternal. He's before all things. There was never a time that God wasn't. There was never a time that he didn't, that he didn't exist. Next, we see that he's righteous and just. Psalm 89 says that righteousness and justice are the foundations of his throne. Verse six says, after listing some of Israel's sins, God says, shall I relent of these things? Verse 17 says, because of iniquity, um, he was angry and disciplined his people. So God cannot let go of sin. He cannot just let it go unpunished. No matter how loving he is, he cannot just forgive. If he did, then he wouldn't be right or just. And that's what we have to know about God and his perfect character. His attributes never contradict themselves. So, for example, if you got in a car accident and someone hit you and they, it was they, totally their fault and you go to the courtroom, and you stand before the judge and the other person who hit you and who's at fault, they say, I'm so sorry. I will never do that again. I, I just wasn't paying attention. I know it's my fault, but will you forgive me? And the judge looks at that person and looks at you and says, they're right. It was just an accident. Just go home and call it even like nothing happened. That wouldn't be right or fair. It might seem loving to the person who did the wrong, but the judge would not be just or right. In the same way, God cannot leave sin unpunished. Next, verse 19, we see that he's peace. With him, there's perfection. God is in in full control. He's always on time. He's never hurried. He's not anxious or worrisome. He's lacking in nothing. With him, everything is right and as it should be. Next, he's patient. Verses 11 through 13, it says that God sympathizes with our weaknesses. He understands that we're just dust. Okay? And the Bible says, don't don't mistake his silence and his patience for as his approval for our sin. 2 Peter 3 says, he's patient toward us, desiring that no one should perish. We can keep going and going about God. He's Savior. He's Healer. He's Restorer. He's Reviver. Other places in the scriptures would say of God, from him and through him and to him are all things, all glory and honor, power and praise. And this is why God demands all of our worship, all of our love and affections, because only he's worthy. There's no one like him. He's high and he's holy. And that's who God is. And we, as idolaters, are separated from this amazing God because of our sin. So how could we ever be reconciled back to God, right? Someone who's far smarter than me said it this way. We, as mankind, 
we had the responsibility to make things right with God because we are the ones who wronged him. We sinned against him. But the problem is we don't have the ability to make things right with God unless we pay the consequences of our sin, which is death. God, on the other hand, he has the ability to make it right because he's God. Right? There's nothing that he can't do, but he doesn't have the responsibility. He's the one that's been wronged. So the question is, how, how can this cosmic gap between us and God ever be bridged? And I'm glad you asked. This is the last point. We're going to look at who God desires to make us. Verse 14, God says, remove every barrier. Make a way for his people to come back to him. But we've already established that we can't do that on our own. We sin against an infinitely holy God, and we can never repay him or make things right to restore the relationship. So we're not the ones going back to God. The answer is found in a similar verse back in Isaiah 40, verse 3. That wasn't too long ago when we we read those verses and preached on here. Anyone remember what that is? It's quoted in the New Testament Gospels. It says, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. God is the one who will be coming to us. Several hundred years after the prophet Isaiah, God would raise up John the Baptist, who would, whose sole purpose was to prepare the way for Jesus. And Jesus, the God-man, who though he was high and lifted up for all of eternity, he was fully God. He condescended. He humbled himself and made himself lowly by taking on flesh and becoming one of us. He was fully man. To be with us, he became lowly. And he would live the perfect life we should have lived in complete obedience and trust in the Father. And he would die an embarrassing death on the cross for us in our place. Isaiah 53 said, it was the Father's will that he be crushed for our sins. So God the Father, instead of striking us for our sin, struck his son Jesus and hid his face from Jesus so that we would never have to feel his rejection. Jesus wouldn't backslide, but he suffered in perfect obedience. God, he wouldn't be angry with us forever because we wouldn't be able to stand his wrath. And so Jesus stood in our place and absorbed it fully into himself. He drank the cup of God's wrath for us down to the dregs without a single drop left for us. He literally bore the curse of God on the earth on his head with the crown of thorns. And in the great exchange, he got, Jesus got what we deserved, death. But we got what he deserved, a right standing, a perfect, restored relationship with God. Jesus healed us and he gave us peace. And so he would rightfully say, I am the way, I am the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He would be the way maker back to the Father. And he would do all of this so that we could dwell with him again, to reverse the curse of Genesis 3 and to restore the very thing that we lost in the fall, God's presence. His presence that brings revival of life. It brings shalom, perfect peace and fullness. The promise that everything that is broken will be made right again. Listen to Revelation 21, 3 through 5. It says, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death will be no more. Neither shall there be mourning or crying nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. How amazing is that? He's so good. God is so good that he wants us to experience him in right relationship. He wants us to know that the love that existed between the Godhead, between the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, he wants us to know and experience that love, that there's no greater joy than that. So this is good news for us, especially for those of us who are suffering and brokenhearted. Because our call to follow Jesus is not a call to ease and comfort but to pick up our cross and to follow him, even into suffering. But those who have Jesus, they have a peace that surpasses all understanding. 
And so you know that if he's all you have, then he's, he's all you need. So even the worst thing that could happen to us, we die a tragic early death. It can't touch us because death has lost its sting. It has no more victory over us. The apostle Paul would say to live is Christ, to die is gain. It's a win-win situation. We cannot lose. And Jesus' resurrection guarantees that. Now death to us is just like taking a nap. We wake up from a nap into eternal life and rest with Jesus. Now go back to me, go back with me to verses one and two. It says the righteous man, this is where we started talking about suffering. The righteous man perishes and no one lays it to heart. Devout men are taken away while no one understands. For the righteous man is taken away from calamity. He enters into peace. They rest in their beds who walk in their uprightness. Verse 13, but he who takes refuge in me shall possess the land and shall inherit my holy mountain. Ultimately, it is a gift that we don't have to live on this earth forever. Hey, though we have God's spirit now with us, his presence inside of us, that's just the first piece. That's just the down payment of the fullness of his salvation. And one day we're going to be with him face to face in perfection like he is. And that's why, why as we live our lives in this broken world, we can have peace and we can endure because Jesus is redeeming that suffering. But hear this, God opposes the proud. He opposes the proud. You and I will never be in awe of what God has done for us if we think that we're good people that just need a little bit of help. If you think that, you only need to be forgiven a little bit. But everyone else, that's, that's really why Jesus needed to come. Instead of understanding when Paul says in Romans 5, 8, that God demonstrated his love for us, even that while we were still sinners, we were dead in our sins, we were choosing and pursuing our idolatry over him, even still then, God showed his love for us in that he sent his son Jesus to die for us. And so if we truly understand that, if we understood it, our response would not be, well, that I kind of needed that. Our response would be, how is that possible? Why would he do that? Why does he love me so much? Believers, especially, we should have a humility about us because it's all of gift of grace. None of us have any grounds to boast. It's not our righteousness. Verse 12 says, God says, if, if you want me to declare your righteousness, it's not going to help you. It's going to do you no good. It's going to be carried off into the wind. Our righteousness is a gift. It's Jesus' righteousness credited to us. Again, this is deeply personal. If you think so highly of yourself that you think that Jesus, he really had to come for everyone else and not really me, then the salvation that he brings, then it's not personal to you either. You have to understand that Jesus came and died for you. Okay, this is an easy temptation, especially for people, those of us who have been believers for a long time. We can get proud and think that the gospel is no longer for us, but it's for everyone else. And that couldn't be further from the truth. It's for all people at all times. Verse 15 says, God dwells with the contrite and lowly. The word contrite there, we don't use it very often in our context today. The word translated literally is crushed it's the same word used of jesus the suffering servant in isaiah 53 he dwells with the crushed and the lowly are the humble like jesus humbled himself in philippians 2 to be humble means that you're not self-centered and you don't make much of yourself you're not puffed up so what god is saying is if you will become like my son jesus if you will become crushed if you will crush your flesh, if you will die to yourself and die to your idols, if you will make yourself low and not in, in my place, in the high place that God is supposed to be, then Jesus will come and he will dwell with you. It may not feel good to our flesh, but Psalm 34, 18 says, the Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. This is God's desire. For us, he wants to make us, he wants us to be a people who are crushed and humble so that he can dwell with us. 
in our response to this holy, holy, holy God who saved us and restored us, it would only make sense that our response and our worship to him is also holy, holy, holy. The way that we worship him should be completely different than how we worship or loved and served our idols, right? Because God is above all things. He's better than all things. He's more than all things. Psalm 1611 says, in God's presence, there's fullness of joy. And at his right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. And God restores us through Jesus to worship the true king. So in verse 19, it says that it should result in the fruit of our lips. Basically, it's saying that we should praise him for this, even in the midst of our suffering. If you're here today, this morning, and you're not a believer, there are two more verses in this chapter. Verse 20, it says, verse 20 and 21, it says, But the wicked are like the tossing sea, for it cannot be quiet, and its waters toss up mire and dirt. There is no peace, says my God, for the wicked. So if you're here not a believer today, I hope you, when you hear that, you don't hear from me or us that we condemn you. We have no right to do that. We are all sinners. We're all messed up people in need of grace, just like you. We're no better than you. But the truth and the reality is, if you don't have Jesus, this life is the best that you're going to get. It's the closest to heaven you will ever be. It says that there's no peace for the wicked because you're separated from God, the God of life. You're not going to find it by looking in yourself. You're not going to find it by looking somewhere else in the world. But Jesus invites you to enter into his joy, to a life that is fuller than you can ever imagine. And it doesn't matter who you are or how bad you think you've been. There's nothing that the grace of God cannot forgive. And there are no requirements before you come to Jesus. You don't have to clean yourself up to fix your life, to come to Jesus because he's done everything necessary to save you. He's the one that will heal you and make you clean. And this offer of eternal life in him is for everyone, for those near, for those far. So if you will humble yourself, if you will make yourself low and put God in his rightful high place, then he will lift you up. But if you claim the high place, then God will make you low. Psalm 147, 6 that the, says that the Lord lifts up the humble. And he casts the wicked to the ground. So you can turn back to him. It's a free gift that you just have to receive. Why don't you go ahead and bow your heads together as we begin to close. If you're here this morning and you're a believer, is there anywhere in your life that you've trusted in idols or yourself instead of God. Maybe it's in your current suffering or how you've just generally been living your life. I want to give you time and space right now for the Spirit to bring those things up in your heart so that you can return, so that you can repent and come back to the God of life. And our confidence as believers is that if God's love for you and me is completely dependent on Jesus and what he's done for us, then we can never mess it up. We can never lose it. And so when God sees you and me, he sees the perfect righteousness of Jesus. He's seen and known all of your ways. Nothing's hidden from him. And yet he loves you fully in Jesus. If you've never heard the gospel and this good news about Jesus and the forgiveness and the life that he offers you, or maybe it's just never quite made sense to you before, and did this morning. You can receive them right now. And you can pray a, pray, pray a prayer like this. Say, God, I confess I have wandered. I have trusted in idols and the things of this world. I have lived for myself. But I'm turning back to you. I'm coming back to you, the God of life. And I thank you for Jesus, who loved me and pursued me, even when I was far off. So that through him, through his death and resurrection, I can be brought back near to you. I receive that gift. I believe and I receive by faith. If you prayed that prayer here today, we would love to share that news with someone. We would love to hear 
about. We'd love to pray with you and celebrate what God is doing in your life. God, I thank you that with you there is fullness of joy and pleasures forevermore. There is no changing with you. You will always be our God who is high and holy, holy, holy. We pray that you would help us to tune our hearts to your grace, that we would love you with all of our heart and our soul, our mind and our strength, that you would become more beautiful to us than anything in this world. God, we confess that we are weak. Uh, we can desire that with our hearts, but our, our flesh is so weak. So we pray that you would strengthen us and help us by your spirit, that everything that we say and do, how we live, that we might live to your glory. We pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen.